Okay. So now I get to the second part of the talk. And um, I will actually uh, mostly, uh, in the beginning, it will be a very kind of basic introduction about turbulence. And then I will mostly talk about the properties of turbulence and the solar wind. And the solar wind, well, is an example of, uh, um, uh, 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 or uh, to study MHG actually, uh, considering the plasma as one uh, fluid. Um, and uh, so, and I apologize if the introduction is very, really basic, but uh, uh, I, I, maybe I would have repeated something that Sergio has said, but it's always good to repeat things. Uh, so as you all uh, know, so turbulence is ubiquitous and uh, it's a ubiquitous phenomenon in the universe. And we basically, and basically at all the scales, turbulence would, is characterized by the presence of eddies or vortices, and from the microscopic scales up to the uh, macroscopic one. And it's a very important mechanism because it's uh, basically uh, uh, the phenomena that will control actually the transport uh, uh, processes much more rapidly if only molecular diffusion processes were involved. Uh, now, but how? So how do we study turbulence and what is turbulence? So let's go really back to the beginning. I mean, like everything that we know, basically uh, turbulence was discovered by Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, he's <laughs> maybe discovered many things and uh, among uh, uh, this uh, is turbulence. And Leonardo da Vinci was really obsessed actually, or passionate, let's say, to observing uh, 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 the motion of the uh, flow of water. And, and in one of his um, texts, actually, this was a translation uh, to English I found. He wrote that, so observe the motion of the surface of the water, which resembles that of hair. And here I put hair in red, you will know why. And has two motions of which one goes on with the flow of the surface, the other forms the lines of the eddies. Thus the water forms eddying whirlpools, one part of which are due to the impetus of the principal current and the other to the incidental motion uh, and return flow. So basically, since uh, like uh, 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 since uh, the beginning, so Leonardo da Vinci, he could uh, uh, characterize this uh, disordered motion as a laminar flow by describing it as a hair, I put in red, and this laminar flow will break into a disordered eddy-like uh, motion. And so it doesn't, this motion doesn't stay uh, stable. And also, I mean, uh, this uh, uh, phenomena was also observed by the naked eye by Van Gogh in his very famous uh, uh, painting here. Uh, which he could observe as well, the transition from a laminar flow to a turbulent flow like in the atmosphere, even without any kind of instrument or nothing. Um, so actually turbulence is, we cannot say that it's only a disordered motion. Turbulence is a um, um, disordered motion on a multi-scale level. So here I'm showing you an example. This is, I think, one of the biggest numerical simulations in higher dynamics that uh, was done. Uh, and um, if I zoom in in this square, so you see there's lots of kind of fluctuations and kind of a mess inside. If I zoom in in this square, you will still see this kind of density fluctuations or disorder. And if I zoom even more, you will always see this kind of uh, 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 disorder and so on. So turbulence is not only a disorder, but it's a multi-scale uh, disor uh, disorder. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as you know, uh, one of uh, 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 the characteristics of turbulence is that in different environments, so in uh, uh, laboratories or experiments, uh, this uh, turbulence behavior is characterized by this uh, so-called famous minus five third uh, power law, Kolmogorov power law. 
uh, so in experiments in the solar wind as well, uh, we observe this power law and as well in the interstellar medium. And this is a very famous, so this is the power spectral density of, uh, so this, this is here the density fluctuations actually. And here we have at least 10 orders of magnitude. And this was uh, measured in the interstellar medium and it's also characterized by this uh, uh, minus five third power law. So now why turbulence is actually multi-scale and why do we have a power law? Uh, now the answer uh, here I wrote would be in the way in which the nonlinear system actually will process the energy which is injected to it. So let's, uh, uh, so take the very basic, so the Navier-Stokes equation and you know, so here we have so different terms uh, the rate of change of the velocity of the fluid, uh, the moving, so the second term is kind of the uh, uh, inertial term, which represent the moving fluid element, which advect at each other. And this is uh, equal to the pressure gradient, a viscosity term, which represent the dissipation. And we have an external force, which represent the injection of energy, which would be like the spoon, which is steering uh, the coffee that Sergio mentioned yesterday. And if we take the total, so the kinetic energy of the system, uh, which is written here. So, uh, uh, so we integrated, so over uh, 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 the volume. And if we want to measure actually uh, the rate of change of this kinetic energy, we obtain uh, basically this formula, which says that the rate of change of the kinetic energy is equal to the power which is injected minus the power which is dissipated. And to calculate, to obtain this formula, uh, uh, you, you probably have done it all, but you basically, uh, you multiply this Navier-Stokes equation by uh, the mass density times uh, the velocity, and then you would obtain uh, uh, this uh, equation here. And if we consider a steady state, so the rate of change of the energy would be equal to the power which is injected and equal to the power which is dissipated. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, and if we do like a simple dimensional analysis, you can uh, find that the power which is injected, it's actually uh, uh, can be written as a function of the mass density times the velocity cube, uh, over the scale L to represent the injection scale and the power which is dissipated as well, we can uh, write it in this uh, 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 form here. Now let's compare uh, uh, the power which is injected to the power which is dissipated. If we take the ratio of these two expressions, uh, you will find actually with the simple dimensional analysis, the so-called Reynolds number. And as you know, which, so the Reynolds number is, uh, uh, so it's U times the scale L over the viscosity. And it happens that for all turbulent flows, the Reynolds number is much bigger than one. So, which means it's an imbalance uh, uh, system. And uh, as you all know, nature does not like imbalance system, does not like non-equilibrium. So it has to correct for this non-equilibrium. So how does nature correct for this uh, equilibrium, a uh, non-imbalanced system? Can you tell me how? So it has to decrease actually this uh, Reynolds number. And how does it do that? By so increasing this uh, dissipation, the power which is dissipated. And how do we increase the power which is dissipated? If we look at this term, it's by increasing uh, 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 the wave number K. And uh, so basically what we will have, we have uh, uh, large scales where uh, the energy is injected, L. We have a very small scales where the energy uh, uh, starts to dissipate. And in between, we have so a range of scales that we call the uh, uh, inertial range. And the energy is transmitted from the large scales to uh, this very small scales by cascading. And that's what we call the energy cascade rate. 
And uh, okay, so this was uh, in the physical space, this was uh, um, a kind of uh, uh, um, uh, illustrated or um, described by Richardson, who described it as collection of eddies at the large scales, they will interact with each other. Then they will decompose into smaller and smaller ones until they reach the very small scales where the energy dissipates. Uh, okay, and uh, I think, yeah, I need to go maybe fast, but so this, uh, the first exact law actually of fully uh, developed uh, incompressible turbulence was derived by Kolmogorov in 1941. And, uh, and this, is, this is known as the fourth fifth law and assuming uh, a collection of hypotheses, actually. The first one, universality, where there is no dependence, on, like we don't consider any special system. Homogeneity as well. There is no, uh, we don't consider any special location in space. And isotropy, there is no special direction and locality as well in uh, the uh, scale space. And he could uh, derive this exact law that relates epsilon here is the energy cascade rate, which is equivalent as well to the energy dissipation rate, which is uh, directly related to the third order structure function here that you see. And this third order structure function is uh, uh, written as a function, as you see here, delta is the increments of uh, the velocity. And uh, what does it mean? It just takes the differences. If you take, for instance, uh, uh, in space, we have uh, uh, a varying, let's say, a flow. We take one measurement at this point here, and then we take another measurement at this point separated by scale L. So it's a difference in uh, the uh, uh, velocity separated by uh, scale L. And, uh, and actually, also doing a dimension, dimensional analysis, we, you can find that the uh, energy spectrum is actually equal or uh, is direct or equal to k to the minus, uh, to the power minus five uh, uh, third. Um, okay, so this was turbulence in uh, fluid. Uh, now turbulence is in plasma. So uh, on sufficiently large scales, as you know, we can treat the plasma as one fluid, and that's uh, uh, what is Wagner hydrodynamics. And there are at least two uh, hypotheses in MHG, very slow variations and very large uh, uh, scales. Large scales, much larger than the characteristic uh, ion, uh, for instance, uh, Larmor radius and the Debye length of the electrons. And uh, the very slow variations match uh, uh, lower or uh, uh, than uh, the characteristical time scale of uh, the ions for the ion gyro frequency. And as a consequences of uh, these slow variations, uh, so there are two main consequences, quasi-neutrality. So we have always uh, equal number of positively charged uh, particles and negatively charged. Uh, uh, so, and also a zero current. Now the key difference to neutral fluids is the presence of the magnetic field, and this would break the isotropy that Sergio uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, okay, so now if we take the MHT uh, equations, uh, we can also uh, okay we can express actually uh, the and if we express the magnetic field into a mean field plus a fluctuating field we can express the uh, 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 momentum equation as a function when we can rewrite it in this way. And here uh, we wrote it as a function of this Z variable, which is called the Elsasser variable that couples actually the velocity fields plus the magnetic field normalized to the mass density. And so it's equal, it couples basically the uh, velocity fields plus the uh, Alvain uh, uh, feed here. And also equivalently to the fluid turbulence, we, uh, well, uh, 1998, Politano and Pouquet, they derived the exact law uh, for incompressible MHD turbulence that relates the energy cascade rate here to a third order structure function. But here we have an increment of the Elsasser variables that couple the magnetic field uh, with the uh, velocity field. So, uh, and, since this is uh, written as a function of the velocity, the magnetic field, the mass density, we can measure these values in situ. And so we can actually estimate this energy cascade rate in the solar wave. Uh, okay, now, uh, yes. 
So I, I just want to point out some. Can you go back? To yes. The last so and certain variables, they seem to be kind of nice and clean, but they are fundamentally flawed. The reason being, that this quantity Z yeah. is made from a vector V and an actual vector V. Putting them together is not quotient. Because the, the given quantity has no other energy invariance property. So, in fact, if you are really doing this very correctly, and such a variant will lead you to non covariant system. Yeah, but mm. the, the purpose of this calculation is to evaluate the law for the increments. Right? Yeah. The no, increments you don't care about. No, no, you do, actually, because the point is if you write down the law, the rate of change. Which is one equation, and then there is an equivalent three D equation also. All of them have to change exactly the same way. Which law? Well, any any law that you like. It has to be uh, a Tensorian law. It, it, it depends. Yeah. It depends on the law. Is a conservation law? Is it on a scalar? No, 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 no. You don't listen the point. Every conservation law is a full divergence. Delta mu p mu is zero. So yeah. it has a zero component and plus three component, sure. right? So in order to be able to maintain appropriate conservation laws which have lots of variance, these variables are not useful. That doesn't mean that the mm. utilization in, in some of the intermediate results isn't okay. But look, have, yeah. they use this variable just to obtain the law which, of course, as you can see, is a linear combination. Yeah. So you can go back to the primitive variable. Right. So and the low will be. I, I understand. I'm just okay. I'm trying to point out, okay? The, for Remember instance, that all of this is for indolence. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. For instance, for instance uh, if you really think in this term, that the helicity conservation really becomes very difficult to understand. No, no, it's there. No, it's no. going to be the difference of these two. No. It, there is a plus. Then what's the point of introducing the plus? Because then you can write it in a in no, a no, no, that's okay. But I'm trying to say that uncertain variables were very useful for a non-covariant formulation. But the, if you at all are going to get to a covariant formulation, it should be the yeah. final law of nature. These mm. are not the best. Okay, way. okay. In that case, yeah. goes yeah, to yeah. in a metric which is not maybe non non Mikoskian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then here yeah. we are working. That's okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. just pointing out for the general audience to understand. Yeah, yeah. You cannot add a protection okay. vector and a vector. Agree. Right. Well, and we have talked about many non-covariant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's fine. That's, that's yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I just wanted to mention here just for uh, what is well uh, for fluid turbulence, we have this phenomenology of uh, uh, eddies interacting with each other, but how does phenomenology becomes in MHT uh, uh, turbulence? Now, in the 60s, uh, uh, the, uh, two scientists, Irashnikov and Kraknak, they proposed actually independently physical image of this MHD turbulence knows as, as the irrational of phenomenology, which is based on the nonlinear interact interaction in this inertia range by counter, oops, counter propagating. Uh, ah, is it here? Yeah. Where? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, counter propagating uh, wave packets that are moving at the alvein uh, uh, speed. So that's kind of the comparisons between fluid and uh, MHT uh, turbulence. Okay, so now more recently, so now I showed you the exact law that relates the uh, uh, incompressible cascade rate to uh, 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 the third order suction function in fluid uh, uh, turbulence. In incompressible MHT turbulence. And then now, more recently, uh, actually, my colleagues, uh, they have derived uh, uh, the exact law, well, for isothermal compressible MHT turbulence. And this law, it relates now the compressible uh, cascade rate. So we don't consider that the density is uh, uh, constant anymore, which is equal to a sum of different terms. So the first two terms, are flux terms and are written as well as a function of the increments of the velocity fields with uh, 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 times uh, the mass density. 
Uh, and this first flux terms, it just can be seen as the generalization to the compressible case, uh, actually of the incompressible uh, uh, flux term. And then we have a second flux term here, which is written as a function of the increment of the mass density, the internal uh, uh, energy, and uh, the uh, uh, increments of the velocity. So this second term is kind of a new and additional purely compressible uh, uh, term. Now we have uh, other terms which are non-flux terms, and these are written as a function of the divergence actually of the uh, velocity uh, uh, fields. So these basically uh, term, uh, they are kind of the source terms, and we I will not show it here, but we could estimate these terms either using numerical simulations or the data uh, with uh, MMS spacecraft especially, and we could show that they are uh, uh, subdominance uh, compared to these terms. So now we obtain, uh, so here I just, for to summarize, we have a compressible exact load that relates the compressible cascade rate to the sum of two flux terms. And here we have this uh, exact law for incompressible MHD that also relates the incompressible cascade rate to uh, uh, a flux term. And why it is important actually to, 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 to be able to estimate this compressible cascade rate. The solar wind is uh, nearly incompressible. The density fluctuation is about maybe 20% or 10% maximum. <laughs> is, is really like incompressible media. But now if we go to other environments, such as the magnetosheath plasma, it's highly compressible. You cannot estimate the cascade rate using incompressible MHT. It's not valid anymore in, in, in magnetosheet. Also, astrophysical medium are highly compressible. If we can get an idea of the compressible cascade rate, for instance, uh, 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 in a compressible medium in the solar wind, maybe I will show later on, we could extrapolate to have an idea of uh, this uh, 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 cascade rate for astrophysical medium where we cannot really measure in situ yet uh, 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 the cascade rate. I still have time. Uh, uh, okay. Should I? If uh, should I? Maybe I can continue. And then. You might want to start it next time. Maybe yes, because it's a different. Uh, so in the next part after the break, I will uh, talk about uh, uh, more so uh, uh, MHD properties of the turbulence in the solar wind and in the magnetosheath, uh, yes. incompressible and compressible medium. Thank you. Maybe not related with turbulence. Yesterday you were talking about uh, ion uh, calculation and observation. Uh, and maybe you are familiar or not, I don't know, that in Japan and in Iowa, people have been doing experiments to produce pure uh, ionic plasma, and they say there are no electrons, they sit on the the temperature is low and they sit on the negative one, right? So experimentally, I found that it's not easy. But do you think that in nature, some system like interstellar medium or planetary atmosphere, where there are many kinds of ions, the electron density can decrease to an extent that uh, electron plasma oscillation frequency becomes much lesser than ion plasma frequency? So you we have a system which is uh, not neutral. not neutral, not yeah. right. I don't know <laughs> if it's uh, possible. Okay. If you have a hydrogen plasma, then the density is actually the same. And the plasma frequency changes because of the inverse. Yes, this is the provided. Well, it was just in mass with the part of the process. Fullerene. Fullerene plasma. Oh, fullerene. Oh, this is fullerene. There's no more than that. Okay. Sure. In space? I don't think, uh, I mean, yeah, on Earth, yes, but. Uh, yeah. So, any more questions or comments? So, this is a, this is a, I just a comment on this. Sure. Very, 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 very nice presentation. And also, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like the you. fact that sometimes this third order law 
pops up yeah. because it is the only uh, uh, rigorous law of, of turbulence. Yeah. Well, Kolmogorov is some, more like a, uh, an engineer approach to yeah, yeah. where you do some qualitative, I mean, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something. Well, yeah. a great mathematician. Yes. <laughs> no, it's very, it's about a lot of application, yeah. of course. But uh, really, you start from the equation and you obtain the law. There are many other terms you didn't speak about. No, no, I didn't. That's only the inertia, uh, inertia range. This is very theoretical and it's nice that you can obtain a law from the starting from the equation, while Kolmogorov does not. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. A, an exact law. The, the whole yeah. idea that Kolmogorov uh, mechanism prevail almost in all decadence, mm -hmm. right? Except mm -hmm. in a forcefully violated when, for instance, you have uh, uh, energy being generated at some particular location, there are unstable modes in a system which do not correspond to the frequency. Then obviously you cannot have over a lifetime. Like mm -hmm. for instance, even in MSD, when you invoke the, uh, the, the electricity invariant, yeah. You can have inverse cash. Yes. So, and in addition to that, every other thing can come into the system. But the Kolmogorov law does remain on the basis yes. of a certain direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the question is there may be cases in which the inertia range is very small yeah, as compared exactly. to the yeah. like in the fluid Good. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other questions? So let's have a coffee break. So a quick announcement before we start. Uh, I don't know if you know, but it was supposed to be a reception this afternoon, but it's being moved for tomorrow, for Wednesday at 7 p.m. upstairs. Do you know? No, no. Oh, nobody told me. Well, we know that you, you know it was today. Yeah. Me too. So yeah. it, in the program it says the reception tonight at seven, but it was good for tomorrow. I don't know how the <clears throat> so let's go yeah. on with this third lecture by Lina. Yes, so let's continue uh, the second lectures on turbulence. Uh, so, well, I have one hour and I was um, uh, 55 minutes and I was uh, uh, planning to do, well, <laughs> now it's a fourth lecture on ionosphere. So I hope at least uh, I can start the lecture on the ionosphere in the second half of this hour. And maybe in the afternoon, we can continue informally the discussion about planetary ionospheres and Saturn's ionosphere. So I will not rush to finish this presentation. I will continue as if uh, I was completely on time. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, an example of um, uh, uh, an MHD turbulent plasma is the solar wind. So as you all know, uh, the sun emits continuously uh, 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 a non-collision. Is it? Yes, a non-collisional uh, plasma, which is the solar wind, and the solar wind propagates uh, uh, in space. Now, uh, the solar wind is a non-collisional plasma. It's well, about 96% consists of protons. The speed of the solar wind varies between about 300 kilometers per second up to 800, 700 kilometers per second. And that's why sometimes you would hear uh, talking about slow solar wind or fast solar wind. Uh, the density is few particles per cc, temperature is about, well, 50 eV, 
And uh, of course, in our solar system, the parameters uh, of the solar wind would vary at different locations. And actually, the solar wind is the only collisional, uh, non-collisional plasma that we can sample directly. So that's why we say that solar wind is a kind of our laboratory, actually, to study uh, turbulence uh, uh, in situ. And uh, as you all know as well, so the planetary magnetospheres, they are not opaque to the solar wind. So the planetary magnetospheres would present two kinds of interfaces with the magnetosphere, with the solar wind. We have an internal uh, uh, interface, which is the ionosphere, uh, which is uh, basically formed by photo uh, ionization due to the EUV radiations. And we have an external uh, interface, which is the magnetopause. And the magnetopause is basically the boundary of the magnetic bubble or uh, uh, the uh, planetary magnetic field. And the magnetopause, so which is, this is kind of the external uh, interface, it is separated from the solar wind uh, by a key region here that you see, which we call the magnetosheet. And uh, uh, basically, so the magnetosheet is just the transition uh, region between the solar wind and the planetary magnetosphere. And uh, is, uh, is actually, ma magnetosheet is a very particular plasma because it's made uh, of uh, uh, compressed, so it's basically the compressed solar wind uh, due to its interaction with the ball shock here that you see. So the solar wind would decelerate, it would be compressed and it will be heated. Uh, I will come back to the differences between the magnetosheet and the solar wind uh, later on. And uh, yes, and the ionosphere, which I just uh, mentioned. So, and turbulence, uh, as I mentioned, it plays a key uh, role actually for a much more efficient energy and uh, 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 transport of the matter from the solar wind into the planetary magnetospheres through uh, the uh, uh, region called the magnetosheath. And uh, so this plot was shown yesterday by Sergio and it actually uh, shows, so this is uh, the proton temperature as a function of the distance from the sun. And it shows uh, actually the decrease in the temperature of the solar wind as a function of the distance uh, of the sun in comparison uh, to uh, an adiabatic expansion model. And basically this uh, uh, figure shows that the solar wind uh, plasma is uh, cooling down much more slowly than what we expect or than what is predicted. Uh, uh, from uh, an adiabatic expansion uh, uh, model, which means that there is a source which is heating the solar wind. I mean, you would imagine that the solar wind, the temperature would decrease uh, as we go away from the sun, but uh, this is not the case. It's actually decreasing much more slowly. And, uh, and one of the mechanisms, there are uh, many mechanisms that could heat uh, the solar wind or add uh, heating to the solar wind. But one of these mechanisms uh, is turbulence. So uh, turbulence is thought to, to, uh, to play a key role in heating the solar wind and, and uh, being able actually to measure the energy cascade rate, which is equivalent to the energy dissipation rate. It can give kind of a direct quantification of this heating of the plasma in the solar wind. So that's why it's important to be able to measure this epsilon in the solar wind, but also in, uh, which is an incompressible medium, but also in other compressible medium. Uh, for instance, interplanetary shocks can play a role in heating the solar wind as well, a reconnection as well, so, uh, and uh, turbulence. Now, there are other, you can talk about turbulence in reconnection or reconnection in turbulence, so. Uh, and of course, all of them play a role uh, uh, in heating or adding some uh, heat uh, uh, into the solar wind uh, turbulence. And of course, this coupling between the sun and the uh, Earth uh, magnetosphere is also uh, uh, the same with uh, all the magnetospheres in our solar system. Uh, this is just an illustration here. And it's very interesting, actually, to do comparative studies of turbulence at different radial distances because, for instance, as, at Saturn, and I will show that later on, the amplitude of the magnetic field at Saturn is much lower than 
uh, uh, at Earth, for instance, or at Mercury is different. And so, for instance, uh, the plasma betas can be different from Earth, Mercury, and Saturn. And so we can study turbulence in situ in different kind of conditions and compare them, uh, uh, compare these properties at different uh, um, uh, conditions. Uh, and also we can extrapolate this interaction between the sun and the planets uh, with the interaction of the stellar winds with the whole heliosphere, uh, uh, actually, and even more to exoplanets as well. And, and that's what really makes the solar winds our closest laboratory to study uh, turbulence uh, in situ. Uh, so I will show you in the next slide some observations of uh, uh, I will start with the spectral properties of uh, the turbulence in the solar wind compared to the magneto sheath uh, using in situ spacecraft data. I will show you observations from the Temis, Artemis, uh, NASA mission. So this is around uh, one AU, also from the cluster mission. I will show you observations using the Cassini spacecraft mission, so around Saturn, so at 10 EU, much further away from the sun. And also I will show you data from the MAVEN uh, Will I? Yes, I will. <laughs> Maven mission closer to uh, 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 Mars, so at 1.5 EU, and from the Parker Solar Probe mission, which is a recent mission that will uh, that is getting really close to the sun, so at 0.2 EU. Uh, so I will show you different kind of properties at different radial distances from the sun. Uh, okay, there is. Uh, let me check something. Maybe yes, if I put it. Okay, I don't know if it, why it is uh, like this, but uh, basically let me keep it like this. So this is, so, and I will show you, uh, so I will start with the spectral properties by comparing actually solar wind observations with the magneto sheath observation. So as I said in the beginning, the solar wind is a nearly incompressible medium, but the magneto sheath is very particular region. Why? Perth, it's a bounded region. On one side, you have the ball shock, and the other side, you have the magnetopoles. We don't have these boundaries in the solar wind. Second, it's much more uh, complex medium because we have lots of temperature and isotropies in the solar uh, in the magneto sheet, and this would induce uh, the formation of uh, kinetic instabilities. And also, at the boundaries of the magnetopoles, we have some large scales in homogeneities like uh, the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability as well that could affect as well the properties of turbulence. And uh, let me see. And also, uh, okay, the reference here is, is uh, not shown, but uh, also the um, we have different kind of properties of uh, these turbulent fluctuations depending on the location where we are inside the magneto sheath. Because of the curved uh, natures of, of the bow shock, we can define different kind of geometries. Uh, which is defined with respect to the normal, uh, uh, to the bow shock. You, you, you can hear talking about quasi-perpendicular bow shock um, when the magnetic field is quasi-perpendicular to the normal, uh, 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 to the bow shock, and quasi-parallel bow shock where the magnetic field, the angle between the interplanetary magnetic field and the normal to the shock is quasi-parallel. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, spect spectral properties of turbulence uh, in the magneto sheath of Saturn. Uh, and so just here, I will show you data from the magnetometer. Uh, uh, now that you know how it works uh, on board the Cassini. And also actually, uh, well, I will not show it here, but this is just the Cassini plasma spectrometer, which was the father, let's say, of MSA, the mass spectrum. Uh, uh, analyzer on board Bepi Colombo. Uh, ah, I don't know why the. Let's do it like this. And so we are in the magneto sheath of Saturn. So this region here. And here I'm showing you an example of a time series uh, taken, selected inside from the magneto sheath. So uh, the, uh, the y axis, it shows the magnetic field as a function of the time. And you see uh, the uh, difference in the uh, amplitude in the magnetic field going from the solar wind, which is very low. And then you observe a clear gradient here, which, is re which reflects the uh, crossing of this boundary, the bow shock, 
And then inside the magneto sheet, the fluctuations becomes much more important because it's, well, it's a very compressed medium. And then the spacecraft goes back in the solar wind. So we, uh, from this data here, we will compute the power spectral densities from the different components actually of the magnetic fields. Uh, and that's what we obtain. Is it gonna be? Okay, that's fine. Uh, so that's what we obtain. So this is an example of a power spectral density computed inside the magneto sh uh, sheet of Saturn. And uh, you see that it is characterized uh, uh, in, well, uh, let me tell you uh, something before. Uh, actually, well, you see that it covers different frequencies above the ion gyro frequencies of the ions. So what happens is that at Earth, if you want to cover this whole range of frequencies, you need to have the DC uh, flux gate magnetometer, and then you need to add to these measurements, uh, measurements from the surge coil magnetometer. So you can cover the MHD scales and the sub ion scales. But because at Mercury, the magnetic field's uh, amplitude is much lower than at Earth, closer to the sun, all the characteristic frequencies are shifted to lower frequencies. And so with only one instrument, which is the uh, uh, flux gate magnetometer, we can cover this whole range of frequencies. Uh, and so you can see that they are, uh, well, the noise level here is not shown, but we are way above the noise level. And you uh, can see the presence of two different uh, kind of uh, ranges. The first one, it is characterized by a power law of minus one. And, the and then there is a break in the spectrum around the ion gyro frequency, and then the spectrum becomes steeper. And here we, uh, at the sub ion scale, uh, the power law is much steeper, and we have uh, it's about uh, uh, f to the minus 2.6. Now, if we compare this uh, power spectral density to the typical power spectral densities observed in the solar wind, so here, this is an example of a very typical power spectral density measured in the solar wind at one AU. And it is computed by combining different uh, uh, data from different instruments, actually, so we can cover the full range of frequency. And you see that the typical power spectral uh, density in the solar wind, it is characterized by three different ranges. First, we have this range uh, characterized by a power law of F minus one. And uh, actually, uh, the existence or the origin of this power law of F minus one is still highly debated in the community. Uh, some there are well, some people say that this actually originates from the photosphere in the sun. Some other work have, have from simulation they show that this could be related to inverse cascades, actually in incompressible MHD. Uh, also, some other work, uh, uh, well, and it's also uh, showed that it could be uh, due to uh, um, uh, nonlinear interaction between counter propagating and vein uh, uh, waves as well, or uncorrelated fluctuations as well. So, there are different kind of uh, mechanism that could explain this F minus one, the formation of this F minus one, and is no, known to be called the energy containing scale. So this is the scale that contains really the energy. Then after this, we reach the correlation scale here. You see, we have this formation of the so-called uh, the minus five third uh, 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 power law, the inertial range, and then the spectrum becomes steeper again, and below the ion uh, 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 at the sub-ion scales we have a power law of about minus 2.7, which is. So if we compare this power spectral density that we compute in the magneto sheath to the solar wind, you would uh, directly see that inside the magneto sheath, so we have this formation of the F minus one, we have the sub ion case, but we don't have the formation of this minus five third power law. So why, and this is a fundamental difference actually uh, with uh, the solar wind uh, observations is the absence of this uh, uh, minus five third Kolmogorov of flow. Now, if you do this on, uh, because this was one example, but if you do this uh, statistically on many, many samples, and if you fit the spectrum at the MHD scales, so everything which is below the ion gyro frequency, you would see that most of the values actually 
are, uh, well, some of them, they are around the minus five third, but most of them, they are around minus one uh, or so. Uh, so the spectrum is kind of broad. And, uh, and if we do the same for the sub ion scale, you see that the histo, I said spectrum, but it's the histogram density, it's uh, kind of peaks around uh, minus, between minus 2.5 and uh, minus uh, three. And, uh, and actually uh, uh, in the solar wind, I didn't put it here, but uh, the, if we compute the power, uh, the slope at the sub ion scale, in the solar winds, we obtain a very similar results for the sub ion scales, but a very different results for the MHD scale. Yes. The difference in the, what does it typically mean? I will come to this. <laughs> so why, why we don't have this uh, minus? So, so then uh, uh, we do, we can do an even much because at Saturn, uh well or let's say it in a different way on earth we have many spacecrafts orbiting uh, in the magnetosphere of earth and so we have much more data and uh, much more coverage of the magneto sheet of earth especially with the cluster spacecraft actually so uh, we can uh, uh, do this on a much larger statistical samples and uh, here it shows actually uh, so this is uh, the Bauschog and the magneto pose model uh, of earth the color bar here, it represents the slope at the MHD scales, okay? And the second uh, uh, figure here, it shows uh, 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 the uh, slope at the sub-ion scales. Um, and uh, you can see that for the MHD scales, most, well, uh, and okay, the, the color which is around, which is blue, it reflects, it's about minus 1.5. So it's the Kolmogorov uh, kind of power law. And green and yellow is not. So you see that behind the bow shock, we don't see this uh, power law, but we observe it only further away from the bow shock and closer to the magnetopose. Uh, and so we clearly see in this case, a kind of a dependence in the location. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, yeah, below the iron uh, characteristical scales. And however, at the sub ion scales, there is no dependence on the location within the magneto sheath. Actually, most we see clearly no dependence, and most of the values is about minus 2.5 or minus 2.7. I will show you uh, another uh, uh, plot. Actually, if we take a trajectory, for instance, this. Uh, an example of spacecraft crossing this way from the solar wind, uh, crossing the bow shock and getting away from the bow shock closer to the magnetopause. In this panel, uh, uh, the first one, it shows uh, the magnetic field components from the solar wind into the magneto sheet and getting closer to the magnetopause. And then here is the local variation of the slope for each power spectral density computed at each time. The red line, it shows the uh, minus one slope. The green one is uh, the minus uh, five third. And you see in the solar wind, the value is about minus five third. Once we cross the bow shock, it's, uh, well, it's, uh, it deviates and it becomes minus one. And only away from the bow shock, closer to the magnetopause, it's minus five third. So why do we have this variation? I, I, um, I didn't put all the uh, plots here, but uh, one of the explanation of this is that the shock, because uh, uh, because of the shock, all the pre-existent correlations in the solar wind would be destroyed. And closer to the bow shock here, um, uh, so all these correlations are destroyed and turbulence needs some time to be developed. So do you think that there is no connection with the correlation with the magneto sheet and before the encounter with the shock? It's everything is destroyed by crossing the bow shock. You disagree, but also, uh, okay, so, yeah, of course, <laughs> actually, this is the problem. I mean, I'm not working on this anymore, but I'm still interested in it because it uh, also, so what uh, we did as well, so this turbulence is kind of needs time to be developed and is, we kind of observe this uh, Kolmogorov spectrum only further away from the Bauschock. For sure, the scale, they change. 
yes so yes so but something else is happening so, so what, what we did what uh, we did as well we computed the we compared the scales so the correlation scales to the characteristic uh, ion scales and we see that for the cases where we don't have the Kolmogorov range, there is no separation in scales, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we don't. We we well, we don't have uh, enough separation between the scales so that turbulence would be developed. In order to develop the Kolmogorov, you need you need scale large scale. separation between the scales. So when you say correlation, then you mean the Taylor microscale? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, that could explain why uh, I would say this this is the real uh, uh, reason why we don't have the formation of this Kolmogorov uh, range. But also, it could be due, I don't know, and this would be interesting to, to investigate further in detail, maybe uh, the Kelv because at the, the magnetopause, we have lots of Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities, actually. Maybe the presence of the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability could play a role in the formation of the uh, of the uh, energy cascade uh, range. I don't know how, but uh, it would be interesting actually to investigate this and uh, to take to take much larger samples only in the present where we are sure that we have the Kelvin Helmholtz instability and see if there is any connection between uh, the formation of this uh, turbulence cascade with the uh, skynetic instabilities. Actually, you don't have data downstream uh, along the Here? magneto sheet. Mean further, uh, uh, further back no, you probably get to see it yes, again. here you mean below yeah, you or? Have the blue on the blanks, yes, on the flat, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 you have more, yes, yeah, yeah. So it becomes more, yes, more yes, yeah. Uh, okay, so so this is an example how so one of the properties, the MSG properties of turbulence, at least in the magneto sheets, uh, 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 the dominant uh, features that we don't have this formation of the Kolmogorov. That it depends where you are in the uh, uh, located inside the magneto sheet. Then we can characterize the nature of the waves actually that dominates uh, in the plasma, in the solar wind, or in the magneto sheet. One of the quantities uh, or of one of the kind of the di diagnostics to, to know what kind of waves uh, dominate is, uh, is given by this quantity that we call the magnetic compressibility. And the magnetic compressibility is given by uh, the power spectral densities of the parallel uh, uh, fluctuations of the, well, with respect to the background magnetic fields over, over the total power. And here I'm showing you actually uh, in blue, green, red, the, uh, the theoretical magnetic compressibility for the three nonlinear MHT modes. You have the Alvain mode, the incompressible mode, which you see the profile of the magnetic compressibility is kind of rising like this. And then the red and the green are uh, the profile of the compressible, the magnetosonic modes, the fast and the slow. And you see that the profile is very different. They are highly compressible. And this is shown, it means that the parallel components really dominate. And that's why you have this kind of profile. Now, if we take an example of the magnetic compressibility computed in the solar wind, these are observations, uh, the blue and the red observations um, in the solar wind, I think using cluster data, Ma magnetic compressibility is a function of the frequency. And you see in the solar wind, it has a rising like profile like this, similar to the, uh, uh, well, uh, to the theoretical uh, profile of the theoretical uh, uh, LVEN uh, mode. And this shows that in the solar wind is highly dominated actually, or at least for this case, by the presence of the incompressible like fluctuation. Now, if we take an example from the magneto sheath, you see that the profile is not rising like, it's like more constant. And this shows the dominance of the parallel uh, uh, fluctuations. And so the dominance of the magnetosonic like compressible like modes. Now, uh, this was an example, but uh, we can do this on a much uh, larger statistical uh, samples. And uh, uh, we, so you, you can do, compute this uh, magnetic compressibility on all the samples in the uh, magneto sheet. And when, uh, uh, and you could obtain different kind of profiles. 
Some profiles, they have the red curve is like the average of all these cases. Some profiles, they have a rising like profile like this, and these cases are dominated by Elven like uh, fluctuations. The other ones, uh, they are more kind of constant or, uh, well, much higher value at the MHD scales of the magnetic compressibility. And these are actually the magnetosonic like modes, most probably slow like uh, propagation. And so this also shows. Uh, which is a main difference uh, from the solar wind, the dominance of the magnetosonic like modes uh, at the MHD scales uh, in the magneto sheets in comparison to the solar wind where the incompressible like alvenic uh, fluctuations would dominate. Okay, so uh, this was a kind of examples about the MHD properties, uh, spectral properties, the nature of the propagation modes in the solar wind and the magneto sheet. And uh, as you have seen in these uh, two examples, so the magneto sheath is highly different from the solar wind and is highly compressible and dominated by a uh, compressible mode. Uh, now, how about the uh, estimation of this energy cascade rate or equivalently the dissipation rate of the turbulence uh, inside uh, the magneto sheath, um, uh, inside in the solar wind and the magneto sheath? So uh, in the next uh, slides, I will show you actually two, um, the application of these two exact laws. The first one, I repeat it again, is the exact law for incompressible MHD. Again, it relates the incompressible cascade rate to uh, this third order structure function that we can estimate in situ. And the second law is the equivalence of this one, but for uh, compressible MHD that relates the compressible cascade rate to a sum of different uh, uh, flux terms, actually, that also we can estimate in situ. And both is a function of the increments. And this is really the difference in the fluctuations, yes, uh, separated with the scale. Only assuming also isotropy. Yes. Which is a, a major, I, I didn't work on this uh, uh, for long years, but it's a major flaw. I, I agree. And also it's uh, isothermal. Uh, yeah, isothermal. No, but I mean for both of them, even for the first. Yes, uh, I I agree. So there are other, uh, I think that this compressible, actually, I'm not sure for the incompressible one. In the magneto sheet, the isotropy is probably. Is more. Yeah, but both, solar wind is very questionable. Magneto sheet, less. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But I, and I think there is, uh, actually, I'm not sure, but. This, there was kind of, uh, um, uh, how to say, um, works that uh, also uh, generalize this to anisotropic as well, MHD. Yeah. No, in the magnetic sheet, it's a problem. You, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, but I don't, uh, because now I'm not really, uh, uh, I have very the bad problem. memory. The, the magnetic sheet is probably not even homogeneous or stationary. No. And that's why actually to compute this, we have, you have to select, well, some cases that are relatively stationary, you don't have sharp gradients and the, so it's really tricky actually, the magneto sheet. And uh, yeah, actually I need to look back at this, uh, the anisotropic law, because I'm not sure if uh, we can use uh, the data, maybe you need mul uh, multiple, multiple spacecraft, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, and so we first, um, well, this incompressible cascade rate has been SP estimated in the solar wind long time ago, actually. It's not the first time that we estimate the energy cascade rate. But here I will show you just the estimation of this energy cascade rate in the solar wind at different radial distances using Parker Solar Probe around 0.2 AU using Temis spacecraft data around 1 AU and using a MAVEN spacecraft data at Mars around 1.5 AU. And uh, well, this is just to show you an example of uh, time series. Well, this is around uh, uh, at 1 AU, you have from the you have first the magnetic components of the magnetic field, the velocities, the densities, and so on. Uh, so here is the computation actually of this uh, compressible, this is in the solar wind, okay? The y-axis is the compressible cascade rate as a function of the incompressible cascade rate, 
this uh, dotted line here is just a uh, 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 slope equal to one actually. Okay. Uh, using Maven data uh, in circles, Temis data in squares, and uh, triangles PSP. So, uh, I, yes, okay, in this sub figures here, it shows the velocity fluctuations and the magnetic field fluctuations uh, at different distances. And basically, before we look at this line, uh, if we look at this inserted figures, you see that the velocity fluctuations and the magnetic field fluctuations are much more important or closer to the sun uh, uh, for PSP data rather than around uh, Earth or uh, Mars. And uh, what this plot basically shows is that uh, closer to the sun with PSP, there is very uh, um, moderate uh, increase of the total compressible cascade rate uh, closer to the sun with respect to the further away from the sun. Overall, in the solar wind, we don't have much differences actually between the compressible cascade rate and the incompressible cascade rate. And this, this is expected because the uh, 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 solar wind is again nearly incompressible uh, medium. And the compressible model should actually converge to the incompressible one. However, closer to the sun, we slightly see some uh, increases. Of, uh, Does that mean that the cues that we showed in the previous slide are sort of negligible? Exactly. I will, I will not. Yes, they are negligible. We could estimate them using MMS data in the magneto sheet yeah. because here we have multi-spacecraft data. Yeah. With, with the measurements, we, uh, uh, Andres et al., they uh, showed that it's uh, uh, subdominant. Uh, okay, then also uh, what you can do, you can do a bit much more detailed analysis. It's, it's unfortunate, it's not very clear. I will go maybe slowly here, but uh, uh, you can study the contribution of the different terms in this compressible exact law uh, with respect to the incompressible flux term, okay? Uh, the first panel, it shows the data closer to the sun and, and further and further away from the sun, okay? The y-axis is the ratio of this purely compressible term over the incompressible one. The x-axis is the, uh, uh, the, the kind of the generalization of the compressible term uh, over the incompressible one, okay? And what you see, and the, uh, the color bar, it represents the density fluctuations or it reflects the compressibility. And you see that when the density fluctuations are small, so about this purple color here or blue, so this line here, the compressible uh, Yaglon-like component, so uh, uh, this one and this one, they coincide with each other. This is a, a value equal to one here, you see? And... Uh, it's a bit complicated this term. Um, yes, so is uh, so the values are here along this line one, and if you look at the y-axis, the purely compressible term subdominates over the incompressible one. The one value is here, so most of the cases are below one. This shows the really subdominance of this purely compressible term uh, as well. Um, However, only when the fluctuations becomes uh, important, so up to about 25%, the yellow color, here, here you, there, the, uh, it starts to see some uh, kind of competition actually between the compressible. Uh, so you see the more yellowish colors here, which is the dominance over the compressible term over the incompressible one and a kind of increase as well of the purely compressible term. So when the density fluctuations uh, start to increase, there's a kind of competition between these terms, which one will dominate the purely compressible one or the uh, uh, compressible uh, uh, Yaglom-like uh, term. So this, uh, okay. So, and then also combining the data, we can see, is there any relation actually between, uh, because when we say heating of the plasma, we should, yes. Becomes, uh, 
why the physical region is the compressibility is totally dominant in the third one? Uh, for which case? For this one here? Here? Uh, yes, it, uh, okay, so there are really few points. And uh, I, I don't know if it's really statistically valid or not, but it shows at least for these few cases, which are highly, well, highly, relatively highly compressible, you see that uh, the compressible, purely compressible term would dominate over the incompressible one. This is due to the compressibility effect. And so, which means that uh, we should use the model which is uh, related to the compressible MHT. Uh, yes, yes. This means that this, these terms, this is the one that dominates. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, and as I was saying, so we, when we say heating of the plasma, you would expect an increase of the temperature, uh, actually. And if we, if we plot the temperature here of the solar wind as a function of the energy, compressible energy cascade rate, you could see there is a kind of uh, overall correlation, except these points. Well, let me explain to you better. The circles are maven, so this is uh, further away from the sun. Triangles are uh, Parker solar probe close to the sun, okay? And the squares here is around Earth at Temis. Uh, overall, uh, the tendency is that the larger is the compressible cascade rate, the larger is the temperature that we measure in the solar wind as well. Except for these points, and I think for these points, there was a large error bars in the temperature estimation, at least uh, uh, at Earth, uh, around Earth by the Temis spacecraft. So this was uh, about the uh, estimation of this compressible cascade rate and the solar wind, okay? So, uh, and as you show, we don't see any kind of large differences between the compressible exact low and the incompressible one. Yes. Yes, it should be lower. Yeah. So, because uh, I think there was uh, probably there was a, a large error bars in the uh, estimation of the temperature from the distribution function of uh, the ion. Um, okay. So, how about a purely compressible environment like the magneto sheath? So, we uh, you can also estimate this uh, compressible cascade rate in the magneto sheath of uh, uh, Earth. And here uh, we have lots of data actually uh, uh, orbit or from many spacecraft orbiting in the magneto sheath of Earth. At least uh, you can use the cluster data from the cluster spacecraft and the Temis spacecraft. And uh, um, uh, you can estimate this energy cascade rate inside uh, the magneto sheath. But as I showed you uh, earlier, um, in the magneto sheets, most of the cases, they don't show the presence of this energy cascade rate. So first you should select the uh, uh, case studies that actually are characterized by the formation of the uh, uh, um, uh, inertial range. And uh, also you need to make sure about the stationarity kind of uh, condition. Uh, 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 and uh, what you can do, uh, you can compare the behavior of this uh, energy uh, cascade rate or uh, uh, for two different type of fluctuations. We can compare uh, this compressible cascade rate uh, for alvenic-like fluctuations and magnetosonic-like fluctuations. And to do this, you can select uh, these two different types of fluctuations by computing this magnetic compressibility, which I showed uh, earlier. And all this green line, uh, the profile is kind of rising like, and this would reflect the alvenic like fluctuations. Well, the red one are clearly very different than the green one, and this reflects the magnetosonic like fluctuations. The green one are the cases which is in between, so we don't really consider them. So to make sure that uh, we really compare two different things. Uh, 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 we compare, so the alvenic like and the, uh, the red one and the green one. And here I will show you two examples of this uh, compressible cascade rate. 
the first example is uh, kind of uh, computed on an alvelic like event. The second one is a much more compressible event, magnetosonic like event. Uh, so uh, y axis is the absolute value of the energy cascade rate. Uh, here it's a function of the time lag actually, which is using the Taylor hypothesis, uh, you can come back to the frequency actually uh, frame. And uh, the black curve represents the incompressible uh, cascade rate. The red one is the compressible cascade rate. What you see is that at least for both events, okay, uh, in the, inside the magneto sheath, the compressible model, it gives a higher value than the incompressible one. So this means that inside the magneto sheet, which is much more compressible medium than the solar wind, one should use a compressible MHT model and not an incompressible one. But also, if you com uh, when comparing both, for the magnetosonic-like event, which are characterized by compressible-like fluctuations, the, uh, the energy cascade rate is amplified by at least two orders of magnitude with respect to the alvenic like uh, uh, fluctuation. So the correlation like this system is like moment in second. Uh, I need to check. <laughs> I forgot. Usually the law must go uh, uh, down at much before the correlation. Yes, yes. So, uh, at least we... Uh, uh, one of the conditions as well is to take into account the correlation length okay, of okay. the you, cases. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's somewhere that I don't know. I'm just asking. Uh, I think for at least for the, uh, all these time series, the at, I mean, in time, it was at least we took. Ah, uh, uh, oh, no, no, we took 30, I mean, 30 minutes to calculate the spectrum to make sure that. Uh, okay. Okay. But I need to check in the papers actually. Uh, okay, so also, so uh, this shows the importance of the compressibility actually on increasing and enhancing the energy cascade rate in the magneto sheet. Now, uh, what uh, we could observe as well, so by plotting this energy cascade rate, so this is also in the magneto sheet, as a function of the turbulent Mach number, so here all the cases, the turbulent Mach number is kind of subsonic actually is 0.1, but we, you can see that there is a kind of a power law or kind of a clear correlation between uh, uh, these both. And this is kind of interesting because if maybe we can uh, validate this kind of correlation for different values of turbulent Mach number, higher values and lower values, maybe it could be extrapolated and applied for uh, other regimes, astrophysical regimes. So for if you have for example, uh, 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 a medium with a, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, so in which, you know, the turbulent Mach number, we can get an order of magnitude, let's say, of the heating rate of uh, the plasma in this uh, astrophysical medium. Uh, okay, uh, something, the last thing I want, I think it's the last thing I wanted to talk about here, uh, I forgot, but the role of the kinetic instabilities as well. So uh, here, this plot is kind of the Brazil plot uh, degraded <laughs> uh, that Sergio uh, showed yesterday. So the y-axis, it shows the temperature and isotropy, and the x-axis is the beta, and uh, the color bar represents the compressible cascade rate, again, for the alvenic-like events and for the magnetosonic-like event. And you can see that if you look at the, uh, and then the dotted line are the instabilities, uh, different kind of instability thresholds, actually. For the alvenic like events, you saw that maybe well, most of the cases here, the blue cases, uh, where the uh, compressible cascade rate is lower, they lie uh, around the uh, stability kind of condition, where the temperature ratio is equal to one. However, if we look at the uh, magnetosonic like uh, events, the highest uh, compressible cascade rate in, uh, in yellow here, you see they lie around the mirror instability. And this, uh, this uh, result could imply actually, or could show the role of the uh, 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 instabilities or the mirror instabilities in injecting the energy actually in the background uh, uh, fluctuations and enhancing uh, the energy cascade uh, uh, rate. 
Uh, okay, actually, it's not my last slide. Uh, I forgot about this one. But in all these uh, observations that I showed you and uh, uh, studies, we make a very strong assumption, which is the Taylor hypothesis that uh, Sergio uh, uh, talked about uh, yesterday. And again, so the Taylor hypothesis, it, it consists in assuming that the measurements taken on board the spacecraft, they just correspond to one dimensional spatial uh, sample. So this is the general formula actually relating the frequency of the wave, okay, uh, uh, in the uh, um, uh, uh, in the plasma rest frame to the one measured on board uh, uh, the spacecraft, and this is uh, uh, the formula. And so, in case if we have so the phase the phase speed of the waves, if it's negligible uh, with respect to the flow speed. So let's say if we have uh, omega over k is much uh, lower than v, then we can uh, 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 use or uh, uh, do an assumption. And this is what is called the Taylor flow frozen in flow assumption. And we can uh, directly go from the time domain or the frequency domain into the spatial uh, domain, assuming this hypothesis. Now in the solar wind at the energy scales, Usually, so the phase speed, well, is equal to the Alvain uh, speed, is about 50 kilometers per second. 50 kilometers per second, well, let's say the average solar wind speed is 500 kilometers per second, let's say. And so the phase speed is about 10 times lower than uh, the uh, flow speed. And so the Taylor hypothesis is almost always valid in the solar wind. Now, in the magneto sheets, the Taylor hypothesis here, I put it in bold, it is thought to be violated. Why? Because the phase speed, well, let's say is equal to the Alvain speed, uh, or also the uh, 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 sound speed is about 100, 200 kilometers per second, which is almost the same value as the flow speed in the magneto sheet. The solar wind is decelerated in the magneto sheet, and the speed is about also 200 kilometers per second. And so, it, so maybe you would think, that this condition is not valid anymore. However, it can be valid in some different uh, condition. One of these conditions, if we have strongly anisotropic turbulence, is k parallel is much lower than k perp, and that's what we usually uh, observe. It's well widely known in the solar wind, but also in the magneto sheet. And if you do the calculations, actually, you can show that uh, the Taylor hypothesis is still valid for strongly anisotropic turbulence or also if we have stationary fluctuations for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the frequency of the wave is equal almost to zero, which also uh, like the slow mode, there are kind of stationary fluctuations. And we know that the magneto sheaths are also dominated by slow modes. And uh, so the Taylor hypothesis can be valid in certain conditions in the magneto sheet as well. Now, of course, uh, these conditions are not enough Yes. So can you say spatial fluctuations in time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, well, I was saying that this, these conditions are not enough to validate or not to validate the Taylor hypothesis, to uh, precisely validate or unvalidate the Taylor hypothesis. You need to have the exact measurement of the phase speed of the wave, but also of the direction uh, and the orientation of the wave uh, vector. And for that, you need to have multi-spacecraft measurements. So with the one spacecraft measurement, you, all, you always need to do some assumptions. You cannot uh, 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 calculate uh, uh, the wave vector and uh, the uh, phase speed of the wave. Uh, the last slide, I think, is I wanted just to talk about some uh, coordination well so in the uh, in the heliosphere we have lots of spacecraft missions okay covering different uh, uh, radial distances from the sun so uh, uh, we have spacecraft orbiting around mars around earth we have many uh, spacecraft missions so around one eu venus Mercury as well with Betty Colombo, and recently with the launch of the solar missions, Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, we can cover even closer distances from the sun. So now what we are trying to do is try to coordinate observations between these different, different probes, at least Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter and Betty Colombo, to try actually if, uh, to study 
uh, uh, at different radial distances, different uh, uh, phenomena, including turbulence. And one of the challenges actually is try to measure uh, the turbulence properties in one plasma parcel, let's say closer to the sun, and try to detect the same plasma parcel measured uh, away from uh, the sun, let's say by Becky Colombo, for instance, or solar orbiter, uh, and study the properties of the turbulence for the same plasma parcel at different radial distances. And so to be able to see how the turbulence properties evolve as a function of the radial distance from the sun, but also related to the expansion of the uh, solar wind. And this is, I mean, there are many studies that are uh, done uh, uh, using these coordinated observations from the different spacecraft, but I would say it's a very big challenge to prove, I mean, if the uh, what we are observing is exactly the same plasma parcel uh, that we observe closer to the sun and away from the sun. But for instance, if you have a coronal mass ejection? Or yes, this is something different. This is like large structures. It's easier to exactly, identify. exactly. But uh, the turbulence, the inherent property, I mean, it's very difficult. Uh, and actually, it was, it's interesting to, to study. I mean, I'm interested to do this, but I don't know how to do it, actually. I, I haven't really spent time to, to work on this, but to see uh, if the turbulence properties, we observe that it's different further away from the sun, to be able to show in situ the role of the expansion of the solar wind on the very varying the properties of the turbulence. So are these differences due to uh, the uh, uh, variation? So is it, is it really intrinsic to the turbulence uh, fluctuations or is it due to the expansion of the solar wind? So uh, yes, so I think this was my last slide. Uh, I think <laughs> I keep it as an open question. <laughs> I think it's a contribution, of course, of both, but it would be really interesting in the data to see if we can distinguish between both. And I think we need numerical simulations as well and so on. But uh, so, yes, yeah. that was the end of this uh, second part. I'm really sorry, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I, I didn't, so I don't think I will have time to start the third part, which is about. I was going to say perfect timing. Not really. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the worst timing, I would say. So no, there was the ionosphere. I can, yes. Uh, yeah, and the, also we have this afternoon at 2 Yes. This and informal session. So it, so, yes, so what I was just to say very quickly, I was planning to talk about planetary ionospheres, uh, the properties like of, uh, as I did for turbulence, very basic introduction for planetary ionospheres and then show you in detail in situ for the first time we could measure in situ the ionosphere of Saturn. And I wanted to show you how it interacts actually with the rings around Saturn. And this is very particular for Saturn actually. Uh, uh, but, well, we, I don't have time. I can present you this uh, in the second, in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yes. Yeah. And in any case, I will upload the presentation. This, I mean, all the yeah. presentation yeah. will be uploaded. So. Uh, upload the, the PDF of course. PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah, that's After. what I'm saying. The after the session, then... So, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. So questions about if you can I hope it was clear. <laughs> but you can ask me. Okay. Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. I, I was gonna say uh, that the, in 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 compressible NHD also in, in compressible fluid turbulence. The cascade idea is because of a local transfer, local transfer of energy in K space. And the energy goes from this K yes. to the neighboring K. And in a, a compressible turbulence, that gets no. lost. Yes. Yeah, because of that, maybe not all the uh, flow of energy okay. yes. along K uh, uh, can be written yes. in a divergence version. So you have, because of that, you yes. have the fuse. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also because of that. Yes. Uh, uh, you don't need to get minus by third, and, and no. you don't. And we don't. So, so much of the assumptions of the model get wrong. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ex I mean, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, my question is like, both of you, like, maybe not to be like, suppose I did some experiment and I got the problem, is it not fitting this over the experiment? Then your experiment is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very <laughs> idealistic. So if, uh, if I get someone like a power law, so, as a person, what uh, features do I look for and what I can interpret from those laws well, about my system? Like, there's a, a nice example of this. There was once, there's a major paper, I guess, where they took the full spectrum of a Van Gogh spectrum. Okay. And it dropped to minus five. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ah, I did it. So, it is the, the power spectrum that does not tell you information about the structure. No, yeah. It's second order. You can have a So here goes the third and last lecture by Professor Pepidio. Thank you. So uh, this is a third part today. Uh, I'm gonna speak about some. Uh, uh, we did the, with some uh, some properties of particles in a turbulent field. So since we have both codes, we have that both the model that which is Eulerian and uh, both the kinetic one the Lagrangian one. Now we can look at the aspects about particle acceleration, which is very relevant for astrophysical plasmas. Okay, but accelerated particles are observed like pretty much in an ubiquitous way. So uh, first I will speak about particles. Then uh, I will go back to turbulence shocks, which today is uh, the hot topic. 
So indeed, we will do experiments with our uh, the code we built together yesterday. I will send uh, turbulence against a, a shock and see what happens. Look at the tracing the, the properties of the shock and uh, if there is energized uh, energization of particles, but also we will build the theory. In each one of the steps, we will have like observation, experiment numerically, and handwork. Okay, really is the way, uh, a, a pretty much a, a, a close, like, uh, way, a, a typical phys physicist approach, I will say. Okay, experiments, simulations, and theory. So uh, at, the, at the end, uh, we will like, a little bit dream far away <laughs> what is happening in uh, or compact near compact objects or supernova remnants or things that are more far away just exporting what we have learned so far in the first two parts of the course so of course now i would like to you to to make a, a mental movie of this <laughs> so there is a coronal max ejection and of course there are you can imagine to follow little particles that uh, come starts very close okay so if you have a turbulent field you uh, you observe a turbulent field like a, i don't know uh, anywhere in a fluid and you imagine two pieces of pla of the fluid that are too very close they will uh, diverge okay it's a, uh, it will be natural to imagine this a, a divergence in in space so uh, with this uh, picture in mind we go back to our experiments so we repeat the experiments of turbulence but with a particle in cell code uh, people of you like you uh, many of you are familiar with this uh, uh, lagrangian like uh, simulations they are very noisy Okay, there is a lot of noise, as we said yesterday, because of the numerical reasons. Okay, now we know why, but we can suppress this noise by increasing the number of particles, thanks to, to, to supercomputer, and we know how to make parallel codes now. But um, thanks to supercomputer, we can increase the number of particles uh, so that we really tend to solve exactly the Blasov equation without no noise. Here you can see the patterns are pretty similar to the other codes that are more sophisticated, but uh, what do we, we observe the same analogies here. The, it's a typical power spectrum in the solar wind. And the green line is the typical electric field spectrum, which is a little bit uh, uh, higher here at high frequency because of like whole MHD effects, for example, or dispersive waves. So when you go to smaller, smaller scales, we observe the same with our peak codes here. There is, there is a little bump here. This, pile up is typical of the noise of particles. Um, please forgive me for this, okay? But we must have it. Uh, and also the other relations, we can you can verify the, some um, typical characteristic scales. But now what is interesting to do um, uh, is to follow the particles of turbulence itself. Okay, uh, there is a, if you check like particles in turbulence and acceleration of particles, there is a really large variety of works. Okay, well, they usually, basically, they use like uh, uh, the test particle approach. Test particle is very popular. You have a field, a sign, and you follow particles integrating. That's the first exercise all of you should do it if you're interested in this topic. What we do it here again is the opposite. We integrate particle, integrate the Vlasov equation, and follow now the real particles from Vlasov. Okay, we th at that time when we did that, it uh, was pretty new this thing because most of the people were, were working with test particles. Now, once you have a code which is simulating turbulence and you have also trillion of particles, now we thought it's not easy, even easy to um, ex extrapolate a few particles from such a huge code. For the there is an architecture to follow and uh, to extract info, very small piece of information because. Uh, particles are flying in your processors in different pieces so you need to collect them and they, you need really uh, good students to do that uh, not me i don't know how to do that actually <laughs> but i pay people for doing this so um, you extract some particles and that's what happens in turbulence this is a 2d simulation where we are varying beta immediately you will see that uh, particles do this uh, erratic motion like Drunk people do this actually too, because it's, uh, it's, it's typical of diffusive processes. You can see here that it's really unpredictable and also they spiral. Of course, the spiraling can be 
uh, really completely understood and, uh, by looking at the force acting on the particles. But what you see from these cases, we are bearing the plasma beta, the compressibility and the typical Alphen velocities. If you go to very small plasma beta, it becomes more, more crazy, the motion, but you observe a smaller larmor radius. Of course, with smaller beta, you are exploring uh, other regimes, other energies. So the alarm radius is less visible. It's there, but it's just smaller. Okay, this is the main difference. Yes. <laughs> yeah. If you believe in the simulation, it's yeah. plasma particles. <laughs> if you trust it. Okay. Um, so really, what you should do, uh, you the first thing, the first classical problem of physics, thanks also to Albert Einstein, who will, who will come back later, is, a, is a, uh, the study of Brownian motion. So you imagine this particle is doing an erratic motion here again, and it will keep memory of the field, which is under, is, is driving the particle. So I can, at each time, I can measure the distance if I start from here and I do my erratic motion, at each time t, I can measure the distance from my position to the original position, okay? And I can square it. So, and the typical, uh, and, and the classical theory, if you, if it, the, is really, if the motion is really ergodic, then it's gonna go in a diffusive process like this mean square displacement is gonna be proportional to time with a coefficient which has all the ingredients. This is very, very, especially in tokamak, tokamak plasmas, it's very, very important to evaluate, for example, the bomb diffusion coefficient at the boundaries because uh, it tells you how much uh, the plasma is spreading from the center of the column toward the wall. Okay, here we have the same, except we don't have a, such a nice theory yet because our plasma is less well behaved than in a tokamak. Tokamak is more magnetized. Maybe we, we know much more about uh, uh, laboratories than in, uh, in space. So we want to measure this with pieces of plasmas. And uh, of course, uh, you can then you have to bin to see if there is difference by binning uh, in energies. So there are particles that are low energy, mean average energy, high energy. And as a function of uh, binning in time, as a function of energies, you get these slopes. And all of the slope at very large time go as like time like t power one. So it means that for very large times, if you follow these particles, you are undergoing the Brownian motion, a diffusive process. So it's a diffusive process, which depends on turbulence. So the main question is like, since this diffusive process is a nice law and tells us uh, uh, how much the spreading goes as time, how much is this value d, the diffusive co coefficient, and how it depends on turbulence. That's the main question about physicists, right? So we will study this. Uh, and uh, there is a theory that was being developed much before this on test particle, has been very well tested by Bieber, Matthews, and Ruffalo. Is like, um, uh, it's a quasi linear uh, theory where you, uh, the diffusive uh, coefficient depends, with some uh, Corsin hypothesis, depends on the properties of the field. Okay. If you want to understand the diffusion of particles, you have to use the spectrum of the field, which is driving your particles, and is in is embedded here. It's it's pretty. It's a little bit complicated to solve this equation, not for this case, but generally this Q of K is the power spectrum, the Kolmogorov-like power spectrum, and here there are some other. Here you see what is the difficulty. If many of you will solve this in Mathematica. Uh, immediately or with MATLAB is that the co diffusion coefficient is uh, both on the left side and uh, as a, 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 a on the right side. So you have to do it numerically. If you approximate, we did it numerically, but if you approximate with for very small correlation times, you can obtain uh, some sort of uh, 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 um, an average diffusion coefficient. And uh, it, in here is this line that you cannot see and also there's a line here, we can uh, interpret the results by means of this quasi-linear theory where we use the spectrum that we can observe. So really, uh, this is interesting for faraway objects because if you look at some pieces of plasma that spread away and they're very far away, we do, we do the other way around. We look at the spreading, we cal cal calculate the diffusion coefficient and probably 
we can extract information on the properties of turbulence. Think about that, right? You, you use the experiment the other way around. If we can establish this link between diffusion and turbulence, then we can, uh, we have a telescope, <laughs> okay? So uh, what happens to single particles and, why, and to their energy? Well, this is the journey of a particle that starts from here. Then, and this is the islands that are, uh, that are populate turbulence. Generally, some of these particles are really trapped in this driving force, like in a washing machine. They start to travel around them. And while they travel around them, there, is, uh, there are sites of magnetic reconnection, which is an ingredient of turbulence, like it or not. And uh, when it will hit the X points, when they are engaged, they will take a kick, take a kick. And uh, when they, here you see there is a reconnection rate. When the particle during the journey hits a current sheet, it gains, it, it gains a lot of energy. So particles are like trapped and they can take a lot of kicks while they are trapped into, in, this, uh, in these closed surfaces until they will hit a current sheet that boom, will give them a, a, a little blast in the Z direction and they will be accelerated. At the end, if I start from a distribution which is Maxwellian, I will start to have tails. So this is the main process. The mechanism is that particles which have alarm more radius enter to the reconnection region and I will have some sort of strange resonance. So this is a reconnection region. Basically, it's not on this slide here. And here there is a current sheet, you see, with an X point. This current sheet has a typical characteristic length. Okay, we call it lambda. And uh, if I have particles that are already large energy, they do not see this current sheet. But if I have a particle which is like uh, thermal and has a alarm radius which is uh, on the order, if the alarm radius is on the order of the current layer, then they resonate with this. They get a lot of kicks locally and they have been accelerated. This is our model, which is popular also for test particles. And I think is the way that can accelerate particles. It's very basic. As everything that works must be very basic. It's like you have a capacitor there. Yes. And it depends on how long the particle Yes, takes. exactly. It it's very basic. And they can, this can also, also hit the plasma, but remember that these regions here are very small volume filling, okay? There are many of them, but very small. So it's more efficient to accelerate than eating. Eating can involve maybe other processes. It's an open question though. This is a very good point. So this is what happens to particles. Now we study puffs of particles. So a bouquet of particles that start from our piece. You imagine you color, you paint some particles all blue in a very small region, and we have an infinite number of particles. And then you follow it in time. What happens is like really, there is a sh very explosive spreading of particles. Okay, so that's what happens if you zoom in here. You, you see, this is interesting that at the beginning they stay very close. Then they do a really exponential uh, dispersion. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, and here we do it. This is the next, the next slide. Sorry. So that's what, first we look at the ex experiment. We see that, you see there is like an exponential like divergence, probably is power law, we will see it. And then uh, these are the gyro centers. Imagine the particle is flying. For people that like gyrokinetics, these blue spots is the gyro, are the gyro centers, okay? We plot them because are very good. We don't really, we are not really interested into the gyro motion it can be a little bit boring, right? It's just a, a disc, right? And so in time is diverging. And uh, so modeling, uh, modeling, we uh, went back to the theory before we were speaking about single displacement. There is a particle and I look at the particle with respect to the original position. Now we do use the statistics of pairs, a couple, a couple of dancer, like in a, in a Tarantella, which is like a typical dance, which is popular in the South of Italy, close to Sicily, where I come from. People do this, it's, it's, very, it's very similar to observations because uh, people like, male and a female, they spin around and sometimes the male leaves the female if it goes to another one, it usually happens, right? Or vice versa. And then uh, they, they change couple, exchange couples. 
and there is a spreading. The, but the circular motion is our gyrocenter motion. Okay, and the, the, the gyrocenter displacement is the center of this uh, of each circle. So, so they, they spin and they depart. And if you uh, measure the distance between uh, blue, red, male, female, in time, uh, this spreading is not like a power law like time. Uh, it's much higher power. It's a power law with time to square on time, even time t cube. Okay, t power three in three dimensions. In two dimensions, a little bit reduced. But why is that? It's a super spreading. It's called like uh, super diffusion. This is, we didn't discover that. We didn't discover many of the things I'm speaking about. This is very ancient and it goes back to Richardson. So Richardson was a brilliant scientist. He was a, a experimentalist, a theorist. Uh, he was extremely good in doing calculations, but he was really attached to nature. So one day he was looking at the, a volcano emitting chimneys and he was looking at the dust, how it spreads going up into the volcano and taking, it was taking like um, data just by eye. Okay, now the dust is like a few miles, uh, 10 miles, 20 miles. And uh, it was looking at the spreading of this dust as a function of time. And he said, hmm, the probability that two pieces of dust at a time R and at, at a time T and a distance R must obey a diffusive equation, which is, it has a kernel here, a diffusive coefficient, which is not an independent of R. If it's, the spreading is so fast, it means that the, the motion is not diffusive yet. If, you, if it's diffusive here, that depends that this chi is gonna be my diffusion coefficient. And the solution to this Fokker-Planck equation is gonna be a Maxwellian. So I will have classical diffusion. So if I have a, the motion um, without memory, for very large scales will be classical diffusion. And I will have a coefficient here that does not depend on the scale. But if we are in turbulence, there is a steering motion. Probably there is the field that gives memory to the particle of this coherence and accelerate them. All of this translates into adding here a coefficient diffusion, which depends on the scale. And it has the information of the spectrum. Okay, you see the difference? This is very elegant. But it's amazing, in my opinion, the work of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Richardson, because this was pre prior to Kolmogorov. Three years before Kolmogorov, he realized that turbulence has characteristic scaling laws, and he used this uh, relation here where gamma is two thirds from Kolmogorov by accident. He said, hmm, I don't know why. Here there is a uh, diffusion coefficient that goes like R to two to four thirds. I don't know why, I don't know why. Three, a few years later, Kolmogorov was listening to the paper and he published this first paper where he gave the recipe, but he anticipated the result. He used it accidentally and is exact, okay? But because I think he was a genius. Uh, uh, this is the kind of solution to this uh, pair diffusion. And uh, it has, it's, it's essentially uh, a distribution of particles with uh, eye tails. The eye tails are the accelerated particles. So it's like a stretched exponential. You can give names to this, uh, um, this kind of solution. Probably there is some, there's a lot of botanica on this, but I don't know it uh, recently, really the name of this complex distribution function. So really can, we can interpret results. And uh, this brings me now to uh, move from my particle study to another subject that we will look at now is the, the interaction of uh, turbulence and shocks. I mean, uh, in the literature, uh, shocks are ubiquitous as much as turbulence. Okay, uh, everywhere here, there are some examples, uh, com included this uh, Chandra uh, supernova remnants. And here, okay, okay, the typical example of turbulence that we have spoken so far. Uh, uh, the question is now what happens when I have uh, such an uh, interaction between a shock and turbulence, like in the, our bow shock, for example. Um, well, we want to do this uh, from different perspective, but of course, since we are thinking about astrophysical plasmas, we want to look at the collisionless interaction. So uh, this is a cartoon of what is happening here. How, how do we imagine this interaction with a cartoon? 
so uh, this idea goes back to important works by Zhang and uh, collaborators, Gary, Gary Zhang, but he did produce a lot of these cartoons. He never did the simulation, but we did it. But, uh, but the idea is very, it comes from, from him, where he imagines that I have turbines with a finite length. The turbines doesn't know about the shock. It has a, is already, uh, is fully developed, is nicely going from the sun with Kolmogorov spectrum, for example, and then at some point encounters the shock. Okay, so uh, we want to repeat this cartoon now numerically. The shock moves fast. One way is like some people attempted to do this. I can send a kinetic shock uh, uh, against some uh, uh, random motion. This is what I will do first. But if the shock moves fast and the field is random, randomness is not turbulence. Turbulence, it has structures, okay? So I want to do it better, this. I want to send fully developed turbulence already in, in a fully turbulent regime against a shock with coherent structures already. If I don't have current sheet and reconnection, maybe it's just a good starting point, but it's not so, uh, so close to reality. We want to do it as much as realistic as we can. So that's what we did. We uh, have a fully kinetic simulation with particle in cells. We sent a shock, and this is the case in which the shock we are sending from the left turbulence, like solar wind, and the shock is moving from right to left. So it's a system which is sitting like this. There is an observer here, and there is a shock coming from left and a turbulence coming from right. Okay, both of them, they move. They really, it's a, they, they squash some time. And uh, here you can see, we prepare turbulence by, with, by using a MHD simulation. We use an MHD simulation, we run it. We have nice coherent vortices. We extract all the fields from the MHD simulation and copy here on the left side. We inject into the kinetic simulation. So, this is, so it, we, we will have really, interaction between MHD kind of cascade with a kinetic shock. That's the, 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 the thing we, we have in mind. Uh, and uh, what happens between here, here we have like uh, uh, the case with the shock with no turbulence really doesn't look like anything exciting. There is a shock moving, that's it. Here we have like 40% turbulence, here like 80% turbulence, this is like solar wind like. And here we have like, 200% turbulence, where um, I mean, uh, B0 is the normal to the shock. We, we are studying oblique shocks and just to have all the possible angles. There is a mean field here and we can set up a B0 and the amount of turbulence. We are keeping it, we, we are providing a recipe with varying the level of turbulence. One can be useful for a CME in the corona, low beta. Another one can be useful for the magneto sheath. Another one can be useful for the supernova remnants, where probably the mean field is very tiny in the interstellar medium, and you have um, a large amount of magnetic field fluctuation. Not really a mean field, but a lot of fluctuations. Okay, so uh, here, what happens to particles? Now, uh, here, delta B0 over zero is this distribution, which it has two peaks. Why two peaks? Many of you that do like laser plasma interaction, they know that if I have a shock, I form a shock, the shock is going to accelerate particles and create, it has a thermal population and create a beam in front of the shock. It's reasonable, right? Um, if there is a shock, there is an electric field which is accelerating locally plasmas. And so if the shock is moving, while it moves, here particles are accelerated. And there is a beam of particle accelerated in front of the shock. So the picture is very clean and is this, uh, the, this one is the, thermal population, this is the beam, which is produced with the red one. But if you increase the level of turbulence, all the population, they spread, they diffuse. You have higher energy, uh, high level of energy, much more higher, like a either or order, order magnitude. So turbulent, the interaction of turbulence with shocks is spreading this population, mixing, and is accelerating. So shock, why? Because shocks gives a kick to particles, particles receive other kicks from turbulence, and therefore you have a, a excellent acceleration mechanism with the shock and turbulence that interact. Okay, that's how we see these uh, observations. Yes, uh, what we observe, like if you integrate all over the volume, 
This is the case with a very uh, small amount of turbulence. Two population do not talk each other because there are the particle accelerated by turbulence and the particle of the thermal motion coming from the solar wind. But if you increase the number, this is a trajectory of a particle in the velocity space, difficult to imagine. A particle in the velocity space is, is, is erratic. It's like a subspace we never think about, right? But uh, in the, if you take a particle in the beam, in the, in the case of zero turbulence, it will stay in the beam. Once it's accelerated, it doesn't care anymore. But if you increase the level of turbulence, then particle can migrate between the two population. Okay, you see that the, the, it's, it's really again a cartoon. You have more communication about these two populations because turbulence is spreading and is accelerating the, the system. So here, this is just averaged over the volume, but if we look locally, I have pictures where the data really look like MMS data. In each little piece here, the distribution function has this crescent-like distribution, this beam, and it has multiple beams. There is a lot of fun going on there locally. Can you relate the acceleration itself and acceleration to first order and second order? Yes, that will be a first order at the shock, second order when particle get more kick. That's how the uh, Zanke collaborators uh, propose this, except now we observe it now. Right. And, uh, and also we, uh, I will say that we didn't stop at just reproducing the idea and measuring things. Um, I will say that uh, the first thing that pops up from the analysis we are showing is that really we have diffusion, but we have diffusion in space because particles can be accelerated and they move with following reaches. Yes. Why cannot it be instant? Why they not? Oh, yes. Excellent point. Because indeed the distribution before there was a, or even lower energy. Turbulence can decelerate. This can be a good paper we can write. Okay, because particles are accelerated, can be can cheese their, their their energy. They leave their energy to 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 fields and can therefore can lose, can be become more quiet. This is another mechanism. We are always excited about acceleration, but uh, this is another interesting point of view. In any case, there is a spread in space and in the velocity space. So there is a phase space diffusion. Yeah, so statistically, you get acceleration. Yes, acceleration or negative acceleration, which is the deceleration. Okay. Yeah, but it's not that you get a colder. No, no. The distribution of particles. I mean, you get wings. Wings, and also mm, you also have a eat, some local eating, so you also broaden a little bit your distribution. Okay, you have just a wider. Well, individual particles can accelerate or decelerate, but statistically, yes, you put energy into higher velocity. Absolutely. Yes. So this is the idea. You have spreading. Okay. Do you agree that we are spreading energy both in space and velocity space? And if we need this kind of diffusion, now it's a new kind of diffusion. It's a multiple, multi phase diffusion in space and velocity space. So we really want to go back to the good hydrodynamics and use coarse graining. I can, uh, I can uh, take a picture of a bunny here and I have an image. And then I want to know how the and how it, the image smears uh, this solute. How do you say that? You see the solve. Uh, while I look at them, probably with glasses or without glasses, I'm coarse graining. When I take out my glasses, that I forgot it today, I'm coarse graining the image and become more smooth. It's like a, a diffusion in this. Uh, in this, uh, I'm changing the grid of this. That's what similarly to the process we are going to describe. So. Rabbits. Yes, it's very rabbits. rabbit. It becomes a sphere if you go grain too much. If you're really blind, then you see a sphere here. But here, if you, you see this is an anisotropic one, it changes. Why I change the scale of coarse graining? Coarse graining is very powerful in hydrodynamics, but now we have to invent it in a, a Vlaso, in a Vlaso world. So I coarse grain here in space, in each, in each, in each point of the space, I have my velocity distribution function and I can average it, the particles in a little box of radius R. So velocity space, I do this in, in the physical space. In the velocity space, I can build some closed circles around the origin. So of my distribution function, my distribution function will have the beam 
and the core. And so I will like to coarse grain by integrating. I want to separate the two population, beam and core, because I want to know how much of the blue particles that are cold go to the beam that is red. And I was also in integrating space by integrating the, 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 the changing the lengths. Uh, how much? Well, in the inertial range. So I can scan my inertial range of turbulence, right? Uh, so with a little bit, since during the pandemic, I didn't have too much to do at home. So uh, you can take the Vlasov equation. You can uh, use the filtered velocity distribution function, which is something that can really experimentalist may like it because you have the VDF in each point and you can just integrate by shells. It's easy to do. I have channels, as Lina was showing before. I have channels of energy. I can just integrate from zero to a channel and leave everything outside it. And I can integrate in space. I love it, this, because uh, then all the uncertainties, the Taylor hypothesis problem, all the technical problems will be integrated, will be reduced, suppressed statistically. So we multiply this velocity distribution function by a kernel. This is more refined, which is like a, like a Gaussian. Hmm? Suppose it's a Gaussian by default. Uh, then uh, once I, I write the coarse grained Vlasov equation, I can uh, integrate from zero to uh, energy, which separates the two populations, okay? So I can compute, we are going back from the, the first uh, exercises you were doing when you, when you were a young plasmist, where taking the Vlasov equation and obtain the, the fluid moments, okay? That's the first exercise ever. Uh, obtain the MHD equation starting from Blaso. When you do that, at the blackboard, there is a teacher there waiting for you to give you grades. But now we did the same, except we do it by filtering at a scale L and giving an uh, energy boundary. At the end, you will obtain this equation. It's a continuity equation for the number of particles at a particular scale and inside that sphere. So this it's a conservation law. And here, this term is like, is the rest of the coarse graining, is small scale effect. So there is a time derivative. There is a divergence of a flux, like in the conservation law. There is a, a term which is proportional to the E and V cross B force, which is accelerating particles. That's the one we were looking at. And some small scale rest. This is the, like, is, is like in a uh, coarse grained hydrodynamics. You, you get a divergence in velocity space as well? Yes, it's here. Oh. There is a divergence, then I, I, I use the Gauss theorem, okay? And then I have that divergence on the shell, yes. Very, very question, I have one part. The shock is coming from other plasma, and a head of shock is the denser plasma, turbulent plasma. That is the picture, and then what happens when this shock interacts with this and moves a little bit, the distribution function behind the shock and a head of shock. Oh, yeah, this is uh, yes, it is, but we are studying just what is happening before the shock, ahead of shock in the upstream. In the downstream, we will see in a little. This is everything that in the region, the near interaction of the shock with turbulence just in front of the shock. But things change, of course, we will see. Uh, now, this is just a theorem. And, uh, but now we can do a mosaic of two, mosaic of the turbulence. We do a mosaic where you can measure these terms. In each, in, you, you once, you, we, have the, we have separated our physical space into a grid of size, maybe in the correlation length, or smaller than the correlation length, in the inertial range. Uh, things do not change in the inertial range from this. It's interesting, means that is very valid to do this analysis. So uh, with uh, green is regions where I have positive divergence, the plasma is diffusing. The orange one is the, the, the regions she was speaking about when plasma is compressing. So there are compressive effects in this, of this uh, uh, thermal, of, of this thermal uh, part. But the most exciting thing is the velocity space divergence. Because we compute it now, it's very coarse grained. So the, in the, here there is the shock in the, Upstream region, the shock is interacting with turbulence, and I have region of acceleration and deceleration. I, I can measure now blue region where there is the thermal particles are becoming crazy, or where crazy particles are becoming like going to the thermal mode. And we can see it 
and uh, measure it. And this is a strong correlation with the, this is the parallel electric field. Of course, when there is parallel electric field, you can make the two. When there is a parallel electric field between the thermal and the beam, then there is particle flowing because electric, parallel electric field accelerate particles. When there is an incoming field, then there is a cooling. Okay, so we have this mosaic. And uh, what uh, we didn't do yet this uh, on the experiments, but we are planning to, uh, this is very recent, uh, but the question now is what happens to structures when it's coming from the solar wind and entering the shock from the experimental point of view. Uh, this is a typical, this is like two points. It's difficult to connect the plasma. Of course, we don't know if the plasma is the same, at, is, is the same parcel at one AU or inside the magneto sheet. We can never really be sure. We can look at the angle a little bit. We studied some angles that are aligned with this magneto sheet region, but we are not crazy. So we are just looking at the properties of turbulence upstream connected to uh, downstream after the shock. If we want to see what happens statistically to coherent structures when they pass the shock, okay? Since we have the experiment. So first thing we can apply the technique we introduced yesterday to measure like sort of like intermittency and the reconnection uh, events in both cases. Then uh, very, more recently, we invented a local analysis of magnetic helicity. Okay, if I have a swirl, this swirl will have a magnetic field lines that are like tied. And this kind of magnetic uh, flux rope, it has magnetic helicity, okay, by definition, if there is three components of the velocity field, uh, of the magnetic field. So we uh, invented a 1D measurement of this uh, magnetic helicity that is can run. It's like a spectrogram of magnetic helicity. So in the upstream wind, there are a lot of spikes for the PVI, for the magnetic field strength, intermittency. There is a lot of reconnection and spikes, but also there are there is some uh, an amount of this magnetic helicity. There are some uh, like um, coherent structure that are very, very tiny. There are some flux tubes in the solar wind. Are there? Is they are well, very well measured? We are not discovering this. But if you apply the same analysis in the magneto sheet, I mean, you still have a lot of intermittency, and your magnetic helicity increases. This has been found by other authors even before us. So the, the wind comes as a intermittency and turbulence. After it interacts with the shock, it acquires helicity. Okay. The structures are changing, as Lina was saying, from the wind to the to the to the magneto sheet. Yes. Yeah, we have uh, we have, you have done a, a series of uh, it is a, they they change of course with quasi parallel. And this is another uh, and we are just adding the oblique case to remain like 50 50. Okay, but uh, but uh, now what we've done is just we have our experiment. We sent the shock against turbulence, and now we can measure the helicity in the simulation and look at what happens when turbulence is, these are a little piece of turbulence which is hitting about the against the shock, which is on the right side. When the turbulence is hitting against the sh shock, that's what happens. It happens that the magnetic helicity is, in, is increasing. Uh, this can be written, uh, I didn't add the, 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 the slide where I, yeah, yeah, when I'm right. And at least it is like HM, oh, nice group, is A dot B, okay? It's a density of elicity. This is an ensemble average, okay? Is the alignment between the pot magnetic potential. So I have B is equal A and the magnetic field itself. If you from MHD, from compressible MHD, you write down the equation for Okay, you have the equation for db dt equal blah blah blah. So it's well, let's write some some of this blah 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 because I'm, otherwise I will run out of time. And then uh, this will have uh, uh, u dot grad b minus b dot times plus u dot grad b plus b divergence of u hmm? because now it's no more. Is, is no more the case or is no more an invariant. There is a term related to the divergence. Why I'm so excited about this divergence of you because of the shock. Uh, we have uh, 
divergence of u. Yes, it is observed. It's sort of like the pile up you observe. It. Okay, so 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 we here we have like the a dt is equal u cos b, and uh, if you with uh, again during the second part of the pandemia we do you do d h dot b dt is gonna be like there is a term which is proportional to grad u h m. So the yes, we we have a, a purely MHD, but then the kinetic scales change the here we cannot we don't have a larger system, but uh, as she was saying, if you have a larger system, the correlation length reduces because the system. But here not we are interested only to the coherency. Why? Because each one of this particular solution brings together an enhancement in an isotropy. It and also the kinetic effects are enhanced in the magneto sheath. And this can also be obtained by a law similar to this. So interaction, but you cannot this only if you make your shock interacting with turbulence, where you have like a Maxwellian plasma with small helicity, it passes through the shock and becomes more helical and more kinetic. Okay, this was selected as a the cover page. This is Van, Van Gogh like thing. It is it reminds you that like, it's Terry Knight <laughs> a little bit as a cover page of print. Yes. Mm. Uh, that's a good question. We don't know. We don't know with this kind of model. We are just uh, varying delta B over B. That's the only thing we do. But probably we have to do it more relativistic if you go far away or other regimes. Absolutely. That's yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's part of the inspiration of this work. Okay. What you observe at the, at the heliopause, right? Okay. Yeah. There is a big community working on that, of course. So, uh, okay. Now we are moving away, far away. Uh, we want to understand if we can export some of these uh, things to the behind the oil sphere. So, supernova remnants. So there are many people excited in my department about supernova remnants. So they may basically do a lot of simulations of these explosions with MHD compressible Godunov like methods that are very uh, a little bit dissipative, but but good enough for large scales. They study these blast waves and now they propagate. So there is a initial condition with a really high density plasma and high, very high pressure. You leave it numerically and produce these blast waves. Why it's so exciting is because if you look at the X-rays of Chandra here, you see there is a, a, an anom anomaly. The, the density pretty much is at the higher at the pole here and here, okay? So why is that? It's plasma physics. Now we can use simulation to probe something which is very far away. Uh, first of all, if I do supernova remnants with nothing around, I just see a boring shock that doesn't look like this nice uh, picture here. But here, this uh, uh, unbalance between this region and this region here uh, can be explained as following. Here, we did the simulation with um, shock interacting with turbulence, a medium which is turbulent because the interstellar medium must be turbulent. We vary also the delta B over B, and, but the mean field is out of the plane. If the mean field is a, it's a simple 2D simulation, and it's good that it's 2D because it helps us to understand this. With the mean field out of the plane, the shock propagates and it will be pretty much symmetric. But if you flip the mean field into the plane, then you can move this mean field until you obtain a correlation with the image. And uh, actually we measured, you see now the, 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 the mean field in the plane, it produces like uh, uh, magnetosonic modes at the shock and there is an unbalance. So we found a very really good correlation with this kind of simulation here. We are using a Monte Carlo of simulations to understand what happens in a supernova remnants, adding turbulence and a shock. And we found that the, here the magnetic field, it, has a, it had a, a degree, a 30 degree with the horizontal line, which is in agreement with the observations. They measured this magnetic field from other kind of uh, uh, things that I honestly don't know, but the agreement is very good. Here we are finding the, the, 
the mean magnetic field by a Monte Carlo of simulation until we have some sort of an anisotropy with the local mean field. So we vary the interaction of turbulence with a, uh, with a shock by using adding the mean field ingredient. So since we know that, what is the trick? The trick is that if I have a mean field, I know that there is an isotropy. So if I vary the mean field, I, I, I can see the fluctuation. I can use this fluctuation to understand where is the where it is pointing to. So that's the use of a simulation to extrapolate information from objects that are uh, very far. So, oh, okay. There is a mean field. There is a mean field, but where does it come from? Suppose you have a, there are many models for dynamo. Each, every model for dynamo assumes a, a, a seed of magnetic field. You must have a small magnetic field then you can add turbulence, shake your fluid, and this magnetic field will permeate to larger scale. But the question was, where does this seed come from? Nobody knows, everybody assuming, nobody cares probably uh, sometimes, but, but I do care, <laughs> I do care. The seed can come from different, uh, uh, there are several uh, explanations. I would argue that most of the plasma in the universe is Co uh, collisionless, so I have mostly, mostly a kinetic plasma. And so we did an experiment. Suppose I have a kinetic plasma, collisionless, and I don't have any electric field and any magnetic field at the beginning, zero. I have a plasma, probably it, it, uh, I can stir it. Suppose I can stir it. I'm not now, <laughs> I'm cheating a little bit because I'm gonna yeah, have to stir yeah. the supreme. <laughs> Okay, the supreme will stir my plasma, thermal con convection, convection over a star, or maybe the drag of neutrals with another interstellar medium. Suppose I stir a plasma, but do you agree we are starting from a, a, a step before MHD? MHD knows that how to amplify it. We want to create the first seed now. So we are stirring a plasma which is perfectly unmagnetized. And what we observe in time, if I measure the energy, this is the total energy, this is the bulk energy, which is decreasing. From zero, I have an exponential growth of the magnetic field. From nothing, and this is the magnetic field spectrum. It starts from here at zero, then it piles up, piles up. Is uh, The magnetic field is going to larger scales, to la smaller scale, and is amplifying. It's sort of a local, a dynamo starting from zero, from nothing. But uh, so where is where is coming from here? This is a pattern. This is the typical flow, and this uh, vast here is our local regions of magnetic field. Now again, I go back to laser plasma interactions. These are very familiar patterns for people that do laser beam interaction, for example, because it's a typical pattern with a sort of like serpentine. Uh, uh, it, they are related to a very famous kinetic instability. Let's, uh, before I tell you the, who is the killer, <laughs> now let me show you some more data. You can measure from the Ohm's law the various contribution. Of course, you don't have magnetic fields, okay? So we measured all the, at a given time, the beginning, we measured the contribution to all the Ohm's law. We take all the possible contribution and we do a distribution. The winning term is the divergence of the electric, of the, of the pressure, electron pressure. Is, is incredibly large. The, magnet the electric field pressure, the electron pressure, sorry. So the electrons became, produce a lot of divergence with the pressure via the following mechanism. So this is, is really too hard to explain it with a slide, but let's try to follow me like this. So from Vlasov equations, I can take moments and I can take the moments for density, bulk flows, and for the pressure tensor, okay? Very easy exercise so far. There is a lot of, but the exercise is very easy because I don't have magnetic field. Suppose you take the loss of moments without magnetic field, you will have this equation here for the pressure tensor. And uh, when you do that, if uh, there is the, the pressure is Maxwellian, the only term is gonna dominate and, and you drive it uh, without a divergence, without shocks, for example, you will have a simple equation for the pressure times the stress tensor. So here 
is, a, is, a, is telling you that the pressure is varying according to the stress tensor. So if I put stress to my plasma, my pressure will become anisotropic. The electron pressure becomes very anisotropic. It reaches a instability threshold, which is the Weibel instability. The electron Weibel is very fast. So I squeeze the electrons. They become too unstable. They produce the Weibel instability. They produce little magnetic fields. In the process, you get a current density. Yes, yes. It's gone. It's very, at the end, it's very basic. We measure the Weibel uh, growth rate and the Weibel mode, I will call it. And uh, so uh, the, the picture is as, as following. So there is someone which is uh, steering my, you know, here it is a nice Michelangelo paint. Someone is steering my, 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 my plasma. The plasma produces uh, the turbulence as local shears. Shears are, are too intense. They produce anisotropy. Anisotropy grows. It becomes a wave unstable, produces magnetic field. Magnetic field interacts with the, 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 the turbulent motion. It gets amplified in an MHD way. And this is like a Carnot cycle that produces, keeps going on. But we created the seed of the magnetic field. It's not a novel thing to use wave to create small magnetic field, but here is a more in a turbulent like fashion. Okay, nothing new on this process. Weibel is very, is very efficient way to produce things. Now I have like six minutes. Okay, six minutes, I will do it, six minutes. So now we are going far away. We saw the supernova remnants. Supernova remnants have mean magnetic field. We are trying to build the model to understand the mean fields uh, far away from stars. Now we want to, uh, I want to concentrate a little bit on this picture since in the past years I'm working on general relativity and numerical relativity. Uh, so this is very, was very exciting when we was observed. Everything is concentrating on this black hole. So tell me what you see here. You see a black hole, right? There's something black, but really what you are seeing is the uh, orange uh, shiny part around it. And now I'm gonna speak to you about that part, which is a plasma. Okay, so we will do plasma physics in this region here. There is a lot of plasma physics around black holes. And it, I will say that this is like where research stands out now for astrophysical, uh, for astrophysics, trying to merge the communities working with different, coming from solar wind probably, like probably me or other people and people that work on compact objects. To do so, you have to really start from scratch going back to Albert. Einstein. So uh, uh, you have to know, uh, you have to start a little bit from the theory, which is beautiful and takes some, some time to be digested, digested. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the general relativity. Essentially, it's a, it's a model where matter tells space how to move and space tells matter how to move. Okay, so I following Wheeler definition. So when I have really, really high densities, I can, uh, 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 change my space-time curve it, okay? That's the main idea. So close to compact objects, I can produce really singularities where the deflection of the space is absurd, okay? Where is my, uh, the Einstein theory is, is incredibly close to Navier-Stokes. Indeed, Navier-Stokes is somehow embedded into here. Also, not, not only Navier-Stokes, MHD, everything is it is a equation, at least, except of quantum effects, okay? So at this level, in the framework of general relativity, everything about my energy, my um, bulk flows is, is in the uh, this tensor, T mu nu. So uh, obviously we want to do some crazy thing. We want to simulate the Einstein equation on a supercomputer. First in vacuum. So suppose I have just uh, in vacuum, it means that the energy, uh, there is a distribution of matter, which is like point wise. I want to see what happens around this point wise distribution of matter. So this uh, the curvature, this tensor here tells me, oh, the space is not flat. Uh, the equation is going to be equal to zero. So uh, to solve this equation, uh, the problem is that nice, uh, the, the Einstein equation is, uh, is nicely compact, but it's horrible. It's horrible to solve it numerically. It's not really good to be solved numerically because uh, derivative in space and time, they convolute. And we don't like it, right? We don't like it. We want derivative in time of something equal operators in space. Then we like it, as usual. Everybody likes this. So we projected the equations on 
ISO surfaces at a given time. The technique is by Baumgart, Shibata, Shapiro, and Nakamura. And uh, the equation, a single equation, which is very compact and elegant, then proliferate in a number of like almost 20 equations that are fully nonlinear. The Einstein field equation is a nonlinear equation of order five. So imagine Navier-Stokes as nonlinearity order two. And we're already going crazy about Navier-Stokes. Imagine something that has nonlinearity order five. So you need to treat this equation with very carefully. We have some numerical techniques uh, and we built a code which is spectral and solves the Einstein field equation. Uh, we call it like Sphinge, it's like spectral filtered numerical gravity code, which can handle block black hole black holes. So we did a lot of, uh, you need to test it for some years. <laughs> you need to convince people that is working, produce uh, the right gravitational waves. The idea is now that to study what happens in near nearby compact objects. And we first want to test our model with uh, typical well-known things like spiral, in spiraling of black holes. So this is an inspiring of two black holes, but we did uh, also went a little bit beyond that. And we did the three body problems with three black holes, because probably at some point they will measure radiation coming from three black holes, because there are galaxies that are uh, dancing against each other and there is more than one black hole. And they may produce uh, very small amplitude Radi uh, 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 gravitational radiation. So it will be very small. So next detectors like LISA may will be able to capture what I'm gonna uh, show you. Here is like the typical signal of two black holes that they dance and then they collapse. And when they collapse in the Einstein field of, the of relativity, they lose momentum and mass with, that is uh, emitted away as a, for, as a gravitational waves. So in a, in uh, Newton's law of motion, they will continue to spiral. But in the Einstein field equations, they will lose energy through radiation of gravitational waves. So it's a perfect emitter, this, okay? Like a quadrupole emitter. So we numerically, we simulate all of this. It's long simulations, I will guarantee. Uh, it's thousand cube. And we put some detectors so far and we me measure this gravitational radiation, but we also studied the three body problem. This is the typical trajectory of three black holes. They spiral, when they spiral, every time that they interact, they are spitting some mass, <laughs> emitting waves. So in a nonlinear way, because I'm suspicious that uh, this is when the, there is a the blast, the final blast, when the three black holes come together and make only one black hole, and they really emit a large wave non-linear gravitational wave. When we, in all of these uh, experiments, we measure the power spectrum of the, of the wave. And uh, of course, if it's a nice wave, it will be only one mode. But if you have more non-linear effects, you will probe the reminiscence of this wind. It's gonna be like the solar wind. This wave will export far away some information of this non-linear interaction. And probably there is a cascade in the, of the metric. I mean, the face, the, 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 the metric, the, the metric tensor is creating small scale features like, just like in turbulence. Okay, that will be, that's a, a novel concept. We are measuring this spectra here. This is under review now. And there is, a, there are some slopes there. I don't know, this is a novel thing. Yeah? I don't know if it's an energy cascade because uh, really this is a measure of a, of a tensor which is deflecting, but it's producing some nonlinear features. So it's something novel, we don't know. Uh, 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 we were in a meeting and there was the Nobel Prize, Kip Thorne once, we were asked something like this. He said, hmm, I don't know, we hope, he said. <laughs> we will see if we hope about this. And, uh, and uh, it's a novel thing, we don't know, but it, No comment, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so uh, this is like a, an animation we are doing now. We are coupling the gravitation, the Einstein field. I want to give me one minute and then I leave. The, then uh, the, the, the gravitational wave to Navier-Stokes in a self-consistent way. This is like solving like the G mu nu equal T mu nu with only Navier-Stokes. And this is a typical example of turbulence produced by this kind of steering. I'm not gonna speak too much about this. Uh, but what we did 
is then uh, we went beyond and started to study the plasma in the neighbor of one of the single objects and do its simulations. But uh, we'll leave you with this. Very recently, working with the group from the uh, image of the century there, we are doing simulations of uh, plasmas around compact objects by using our peak codes, by using uh, a code which must be relativistic because otherwise they are very close to the compact, but it's special relativistic. So we have the big black hole and we take little cubes around the black holes. So locally you can apply just special relativity for Maxwell equations. So we are solving the Maxwell equation for particles in the vicinity of a black hole. And again, you find uh, nice vortices. They are a little bit different. Uh, the energy is very high here of the thermal motion. We are studying uh, these uh, effects. And um, what we observe is that really turbulence near black holes, so these are typical trajectories of electrons and ions. Electrons gets very accelerated, like, like 0 0.99999C. <laughs> Okay, it's becoming very high accelerated and produces power law. Why these power laws are important? Because from this uh, distribution of energies, we build model to understand the shadow of the black hole. The emission of the black hole must be modeled through the, these power laws on the spectrum. That's where now is the challenge. We want to study local effects with kinetic to extrapolate information and reproduce the real shadow of a black hole with higher resolution. So that's what we are doing now. And uh, okay, this is another animation of this uh, uh, super ultra relativistic turbulence with particles. And um, this is how particles are accelerated and they do their nice journey and get kicks into vortices and gets accelerated. Uh, but uh, instead of the of conclusion of my course, which are always boring and you want to hit, uh, I would like to acknowledge all the collaborators in, uh, in, uh, in, my, in, uh, in the recent years, because uh, I always like to keep science multidisciplinary. I try to steal something from Navistocks mostly and bring it to MHD, from MHD to Navistocks, from, uh, from both of them to particle physics. So uh, I do collaborate a lot with space missions. I, I even married one of them. This is my wife, actually. Yes. yes. And um, so we do with people that really know how to manage data, but then you need to work with theorists like Pablo, Minini, Matthews, that are plasma physicists. These are plasma physicists. They work in, with me in the past years, but a lot with the, the hydraulic engineers, a lot, because I work on river flows where we measure like third order laws in an isotropic systems. So, and I energy astrophysics and finally with general relativity. Here there's also a student of mine, which is very good and very shy. When I took it, I take a picture of you, he turned, right? <laughs> so I had a picture of him, but he's very shy. So uh, thank you for your attention in these uh, three courses. And sorry if I was late. So uh, we, we are going to have a small lunch for the lecture, but it's a uh, it's very uneven distribution, mostly the night and the So we want to have two women from the participants to do that. That is to be the author who are the senior most people who are professors in their university. Can you please raise your hand, women who are professors in the University of Paris? Are you? Right. Okay. So, but you're not a woman. <laughs> so, I suppose we have Krishna, and you said you are a professor, and you are a professor? Okay, you are a professor. So, it becomes very difficult to choose. So, I think that. Yeah. I'm going to um, like, what should I say? Um, no, you can choose the, the senior most amongst you. So you, what the senior most amongst you? How long have you been a professor? Long time. And you, Clara? Eight years. Eight years. You, Jyoti? Eight years. You? No, okay. All right, so we probably can have Prisma and Lela. Please come and join us. It, it's it's not a crime or anything. We just want our company to be a little bit more balanced. Oops. Stop saying I'm not supposed to.